Consistent Premillennial Preterism A Quantum Shift Episode 2 The Timing of the Arrival of the Kingdom Part 1 The key text is Matthew chapter 16 verses 27 and 28. Welcome to my audio series. In episode 1 we briefly focused on the nature of the Kingdom of God as revealed by Jesus himself particularly in the key text of Luke chapter 17 verses 20 and 21. I also gave a brief introduction about myself while also explaining a little about the doctrinal position that I hold known as consistent premillennial preterism. In this episode we shall be considering what the New Testament reveals as to the timing of the arrival of the Messianic Kingdom. And for many of you listening to this you may find the conclusion rather startling. So let's jump straight in by taking a look at the key text of Matthew 16, 27 and 28. I will be reading from the New International Version. This passage can also be found in Mark chapter 8, verse 38 to chapter 9, verse 1, and Luke chapter 9, verses 26 to 27. For the Son of Man is going to, or about to, come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The first sentence here is clearly referring to the second advent of Christ, also known as the coming of the Son of Man an event that would involve a spiritual heavenly manifestation of God's glory along with an angelic presence that is a gathering of heavenly spiritual beings with Christ it is also evident that the judgment is associated with that glorious day of the Lord when each person would be rewarded according to what one has done virtually all biblical commentators would agree with this interpretation But then something strange and inconsistent usually occurs when most try and interpret the second sentence of verse 28. In this next verse, Jesus goes on to emphasize to his disciples that some of them would not experience death before they would see the coming of the Son of Man in his kingdom. Now the parallel passage in Mark 9 verse 1 says that those who wouldn't taste death would see the kingdom of God come with power. Therefore, the coming of the Son of Man in his kingdom, in Matthew's account, is equivalent to the kingdom of God coming with power in Mark's account. This establishing of the kingdom in power was clearly a future event associated with the return of Christ. That means that the coming of the Son of Man that is the second appearing of Christ and the judgment are one and the same event which would result in the full establishing of the messianic kingdom in power yet Jesus clearly said that this event would occur within the lifetime of the apostles in the first century AD this is one of the strongest passages in the New Testament that forces the interpreter to this conclusion especially in light of Daniel chapter 7 which we shall consider in the next episode. Therefore, Jesus was clearly telling his disciples that some of them, that is at least two of them, would witness the coming of the Son of Man and his kingdom in power and glory within their lifetime. That is, this coming was to occur in the first century AD within the lifetime of the Apostles. This was a clear allusion to the visions of Daniel chapter 7 and 12 and the fulfillment must have occurred in 70 AD when the old covenant officially ended there isn't any other event in the first century that satisfies the fulfillment of these words of Jesus in line with Daniel 7 Jesus was also alluding to Isaiah chapter 40 verse 10 which speaks of the Lord coming with power to rule and to judge bringing his reward with him to repay his covenant people for what they had done 
whether those deeds were good or evil. You can also cross-reference Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11 and Revelation 22 verse 12. Now, if this coming of the Son of Man and his kingdom, spoken above, was one and the same as the arrival of the kingdom of God with power, then it follows that this is one and the same event as the Son of Man coming in his Father's glory with his angels and then rewarding each person for their deeds. That is to say, this is describing the second appearing of Christ, followed by the resurrection and judgment of Israel and the nations. And some of the disciples of that generation were told that they would remain alive until that day arrived. In the quote from Matthew 16, the Greek word mellow is used in verse 27. This word mellow refers to an action or event that is about to be, that is, something on the verge of occurring. Even though the word is essentially describing an intention or purpose, in virtually every place in the New Testament it is referring to something on the verge of happening. And these things generally did occur at some point in time, whether almost immediately or sometime later. And I've personally checked all these New Testament occurrences. There are many places in the New Testament where mellow is used, but some translations have obscured its true meaning in certain instances and have not translated it consistently. Matthew chapter 16 is a perfect example. The NIV, quoted above, reads going to come, which doesn't signify a time limit, whereas the interlinear Greek-English New Testament by George Ricker Berry reads correctly about to come, which is why I added that to this quote when I read it earlier. There are a number of literal versions that translate mellow much more consistently. For example, Young's Literal Version, the Concordant Literal New Testament, and G.R. Berry's Interlinear, mentioned earlier. Therefore, this more accurate reading indicates that this event of Christ's second appearing was on the verge of happening, though no one knew the precise day or hour. This translation and interpretation is confirmed by what follows when Jesus stated that some of the disciples would remain alive to witness the event. Now it is worth pointing out here that Dr. Ken Gentry in his excellent book Before Jerusalem Fell dating the book of Revelation had this to say on the Greek word mellow when he was discussing Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 and chapter 3 verse 10. <clears throat> Quote, when used with the aorist infinitive as in Revelation 1.19, the words preponderate usage and preferred meaning is be on the point of, be about to. The same is true when the word is used with the present infinitive, as in Revelation 3.10. Indeed, mellow with the infinitive expresses imminence. End of quote. Uh, Gentry cites the lexicons of Arndt and Gingrich Thayer and Abbott Smith. Uh, you can see pages 141 and 142 of Before Jerusalem Fell, the revised edition 1998 for this quote. <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, in our key text of Matthew 16:27, the word mellow is in the same grammatical form as it is in Revelation 1:19, the text that Gentry was considering. Now, as far as I'm aware, though, Gentry, who holds to the traditional partial preterist view, doesn't apply his argument consistently when dealing with more difficult texts about the Second Advent, such as Matthew 16:27. Another case in point is Acts chapter 17, verse 31, which again uses mellow in the same grammatical form. When Paul said, that the day when God would judge the world with justice through Christ was about to be. That is, the great day of judgment relating to Christ's second appearing was on the verge of occurring. That is, it was imminent. There are many more examples that could be given, 
where mellow is being used in the present infinitive, leading to the same conclusion, that the writers were talking about things that were imminent, on the verge of occurring. In light of these things, I am therefore convinced that we are to understand such texts as Matthew 16, 27 and 28 as prophesying events that actually occurred in the first century AD. I believe that this is the only way of being intellectually honest when studying the New Testament, especially if one wishes to be consistent with one's interpretation and understanding. The more traditional interpretations of Matthew 16, 28 understand the fulfillment to have occurred either in the Transfiguration event or at Pentecost at the coming of the Holy Spirit. I don't think that either of these events are satisfactory interpretations of Jesus' words when examined closely. And neither of these events truly fulfilled the coming of the Son of Man in his kingdom with power in accordance with Daniel chapter 7. According to the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, the Transfiguration occurred shortly after Jesus spoke these words, and none of the Apostles had died at this point. Jesus had clearly indicated that some of them would die before the time of his coming, because he clearly stated that some of them would live to see it, hence it follows that some would also die before his coming. And the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost occurred when only one of the Apostles had died, Judas Iscariot, who had been replaced by Matthias by the time of Pentecost. See Acts 1, 15-26. Also, according to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, the Apostles and disciples were about to suffer persecution during their evangelizing mission and they would still be evangelizing the cities of Israel by the time the coming of the, San, coming of the Son of Man was to occur. Yet when Pentecost arrived, the disciples hadn't even begun their evangelistic mission, and the persecution was only just about to begin. No, I think that there is only one event that fits all of the criteria and that is the destruction of the Temple and the city of Jerusalem in the Day of the Lord of 70 AD. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18 we have probably one of the earliest accounts of the Apostle Paul describing the events of Christ's coming or parousia. Here is what he wrote in verses 15 to 18. According to the Lord's word we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming, that is the Greek parousia, of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now Paul had begun this passage by reassuring the Thessalonian Christians that those believers who had died, that is those who had fallen asleep in Christ, would not miss out on the events of Christ's parousia. He then says that according to the Lord's word, those who were still living when the day of the Lord arrived that is, we who are still alive, which was spoken to those in the first century, would certainly not have precedence over those who had died. He also stated again in verse 17 that we who are still alive and are left would join with the risen believers to meet with the Lord together, clearly in a resurrected, transformed state. Paul had stated that what he was saying here was according to the Lord's own word. And there are only a few places in the Gospel accounts where we find Jesus saying something about his followers remaining alive till his return. That is, till the coming of the Son of Man. Take for instance Matthew chapter 10 verses 22 and 23. 
You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now, firstly, Jesus tells his disciples that they must stand firm to the end because they would be persecuted while they proclaimed the gospel to Israel. The end that Jesus was talking about here was evidently referring to the end of the Old Covenant age. He then tells them that they would not finish their evangelistic mission to the towns of Israel before the coming of the Son of Man. It is possible that what Jesus meant by the towns of Israel could have included the Jewish cities in the Diaspora and not just the towns and villages of the land of Palestine. Either way, the mission of the original twelve apostles was to largely be to the Jewish nation, particularly to those in the land of Palestine. It was the Apostle Paul who was later to be given the apostolic mission to take the gospel to the Gentile nations of the Mediterranean world. Anyhow, it is very evident from this text in Matthew chapter 10 that this coming of Christ was to occur within the generation of the apostles, while those who were still alive were preaching the gospel to the Jewish people. Now, apart from our key text in Matthew chapter 16, there are a couple of places in the Gospel of John where it is clear that Jesus was promising his disciples that he would return within their lifetime or generation. I shall now read John 14 verse 3, followed by John chapter 21 verses 20 to 24. This is verse 3 of John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And now to John 21, starting at verse 20. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to, to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. And we know that his testimony is true. In the first verse quoted from John 14, Jesus had promised his apostles on the night before his death that he was going away to the Father to prepare a place for them and that he would come back for them and take them to be with him in the Father's presence. This promise would be a little redundant if he was talking about returning for them hundreds or thousands of years later after they'd all died. He was clearly indicating that his return would be soon, within that generation. Some of them would still be alive to witness his return. In the subsequent quote from the last chapter of John's Gospel, the resurrected Jesus tells Peter to essentially mind his own business about John's earthly fate. For if Jesus wanted John to remain alive until his return, what was that to Peter? Peter was to follow his own path within God's will. Now again, this statement of Jesus would be rather meaningless if there wasn't a strong possibility that John could in fact remain alive until Jesus returned for them. It is true, as stated in verse 23, that this caused a rumour to spread that John wouldn't die at all. But the text emphasises the fact that Jesus didn't actually say that John wouldn't die, only that he was expressing the possibility that John would remain alive until his return if he wanted him to. In other words, 
Jesus had not actually promised that John would definitely remain alive until his return, but it was still possible. Therefore, this indicates very clearly that Christ's return would occur within that generation, within the lifetime of the Apostles. Now, it is evident that the Apostle John would not be one of those who would remain alive until the coming of the Lord, because Jesus had in fact already indicated to John and his brother James that they would both drink from the cup of martyrdom. Now, this information can be found in Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 23, and Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 40. It is also worth adding here that any church tradition that says that John lived to a good old age and was never martyred is clearly false, because it goes against the clear teaching of the New Testament. In another place, Jesus also promised his disciples that in relation to the great persecution that was soon to come upon them, those who endured to the end would save themselves, so that not a hair of their head would perish. See Luke 21, verses 17 to 19. This was evidently something much more than just a promise of resurrection after their deaths. This was an encouragement to endure to the end of the age, so that if they were to remain alive till the coming of the Son of Man, not a hair of their heads would perish, for they would be transformed at the parousia. Therefore, the only honest and coherent conclusion that we can come to when considering these texts is that the coming of the Son of Man and the arrival of his kingdom in power would occur in that first century generation within the lifetime of the Apostles. That is, within the lifetime of those who were being addressed, either by word or letter, as first century followers of Christ. And they were the first fruits of all believers ever since. In the next episode, we shall consider the key text of Daniel chapter 7 and how the details of this vision establishes the correct timing for the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. For further information, please visit my website at www.purposeoflife.org.uk.